All right, here we go. Welcome everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Matthew Burgess, and this is Katri Chen. Hi. And I have a feeling people are going to be trickling in for the next minute or so. Right. Um, we're on. Okay. So, as you probably know, we are here to celebrate our book, book birthday for our brand new picture book, The Bear in the Moon. And I wanted to start by just saying that the idea of this event is to just sort of have a conversation. Katya and I have had such a great time collaborating on this book and we love it so much that we thought one way to celebrate would be to share some of our collaboration and our process and how we read this story. Um, I want to also say thank you to Erica, um, my amazing agent who arranged this and everyone at Somal Alive for giving us the forum to share this with you and to talk to you tonight. Um, we're going to start by just briefly introducing ourselves. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Katya. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, like Matthew was saying, we're so excited um, about this book and we're so excited to share it with you. Um, I um, started in illustration um, through concept art and doing film work. And um, I grew up in Brazil and I came to the US um, over, I don't know, 20 years ago, but I moved to, the, to New York in 2013. And um, yeah, and now I'm in, I'm in Pennsylvania right now, um, quarantining in place. And um, yeah, um, I'll turn it to Matthew. Um, I was born in California and I grew up there. Um, I moved to New York City about a little over 20 years ago. Um, kind of to become a poet and to go to graduate school. I studied at Brooklyn College. Um, I went on to get my doctorate at the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, and now actually I'm dividing my time between Brooklyn and Berlin. Um, so right now it is a little bit later than it is uh, in Pennsylvania. It's um, a little bit after 11. So we're super excited that we get to share this with you from Pennsylvania and Berlin um, and to invite you into this sort of fun, intimate conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we thought since this book is so rooted in the natural world, the moon is kind of, you could say, a uh, main character. And we thought that we'd start by just talking a little bit about um, a childhood memory that's rooted in the natural world. So Katya? Yeah, um, so I grew up in Sao Paulo, like I was saying, in Brazil, and Sao Paulo is a big city. So I didn't really grow up around lots of um, nature or anything like that, but uh, my, my father used to work in a sandal factory and in the factory, there was a, a farm and um, in the occasional, you know, there, there are times when I would actually go to the, to the factory with my dad and be able to visit the farm animals. And, um, and it was one of the, the sort of foundations for me to, to kind of be connected to the natural world in that way. Um, and that's just one of my earliest memories of that. What about you, Matthew? Um, my father used to take us on backpacking trips. And so I have these early childhood memories of spending like a week in the country in the Sierra Nevadas in California and kind of being free to roam. Um, and like we would catch crickets and fish with them and, and catch trout. Um, and so when I wrote this story, I was thinking about where it was located in my imagination and that uh, landscape was what came up. Um, I also, in college, I went on an Outward Bound trip. Do you know those? No, I don't. It's sort of, it's like a 14 day wilderness journey. Okay. And part of the experience was a three day solo. 
Oh wow! They, they give you yeah. How old were you when you did it? I was. It was the. I think it was the summer after my second year of college. Wow. Okay. And they for the solo they gave you um, one bag of trail mix and um, like some kind of crystal light. You know, some of those like packets that you could put in your river water. Yeah. And um, I had three days of just being totally alone under that sky, watching the moon. And so when I was writing it, really like that was the location where the bear was, which is sort of strange, like how you summon up some very particular location, I think from memory to bring to the stories that we make. I don't know, is that true for you? Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's for me because I've traveled so much, as, a, as when I was a kid, I used to move around a lot. And so there wasn't one place that I I sum up when I think of home, but there's always that feeling of home, right? Mm -hmm. I understand. And I and I find it in a lot of different places. But yeah, so definitely memories, um, but in a different way. I'm sort of curious, actually, do any of the landscapes in the Bear in the Moon, are they located in Brazil for you in, in terms of like, how you conceived of those landscapes, what you drew from when you painted them? Um, not exactly, no. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was more, uh, it was a discovery on the page mm -hmm. and, and, and imagining myself in that world and it kind of just sort of uncovering it as, he, as I went without any real destination for them. Right. Yeah. That seems like a good segue actually to share with those of you that are here um, an excerpt from the book. So I'm gonna share like the first half. Um, and I read it and made a little video because as you know, it's sort of tricky with a reader read aloud to hold the book and in a way that you can really appreciate the images. So um, you might want to turn up your volume a little bit to hear this. Um, so enjoy. The Bear and the Moon. I had to show the end papers. <laughs> and the book plate. Words by Matthew Burgess, pictures by Katya Chen. Opening his eyes after a long snooze, the bear saw a red dot in the blue sky. The closer it floated, the bigger and rounder and redder the dot became until it was no longer a dot at all. It was red as a berry and round like the moon with a long silver string drifting brightly in the breeze. Curious, the bear went to investigate. First, he tried to catch the string between his teeth, but when it floated out of reach, he climbed onto a boulder and stood on his two hind legs balancing. Uh-oh, the bear wobbled, slipped and tumbled into a furry puddle. Poor bear. But then it drifted nearer and nearer. There, suddenly the bear felt lighter than air. When he walked, it walked. When he danced, it danced. And when dinner time arrived, he tied the silver string to a stone. The bear enjoyed the quiet company while he ate beside the creek. And when evening became night, it glowed softly in the moonlight. The next morning, the bear gave it a tour of his whereabouts. Here is the tree I can climb to find honey. Here is where I curl into a ball and roll down the hill. And this is the spot where I sit on the pot. All the while, the floating red thing smiled back at him like a friend. It dipped and breathed and bumped against the bear's cheek. What a nice thing. What a wonderful thing. What a squishable, huggable thing. Uh-oh. 
So I'll leave it, <clears throat> I'll leave it there at the uh-oh. Um, and what you'll find is that he has to deal with the loss of his new friend and that in his anguish, in his grief, in his loss, in his sadness, um, the moon rises and speaks to him. I, Katya, I'm tempted to like um, mention you reading that part to Emmy. Right. And that's uh, kind of like a dramatic page turn with the uh oh. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a dramatic. I mean, I should say that he's on the younger side of the age group. But when I first read it to Emmy, I mean, it was such a, first off, just a journey to get to the actual book and to be able to hold it in my hands and then show it to Emmy and see for the first time his reaction to the book. And that page turn of, uh oh, just, I mean, just. It's he's, exciting. It's exciting. Huh? It's exciting. It's exciting. And he wasn't expecting it. And so when I flipped it, he just was like, oh my gosh, it's completely, it's, right. it's devastating, right? right? Because it's the popping of this balloon. So it certainly had the emotional reaction to that. Right. So right. it's a very, now it's a very gentle page turn, right? Now I'm kind of much more gentle with it. But readers and viewers can rest assured that everything is resolved by the end. Exactly. <laughs> yes. That's interesting. And I also want to say here that um, for those of you that are here, we're going to have a Q&A in a little bit. So please feel free to um, type in the chat and add any questions. Um, we'll be turning to that in a little bit. But first, um, now that you've caught a glimpse of the book and you've seen this beautiful world and character that Katya has created, um, Katya, will you share some of your process of how you envisioned and created that world? I'll be so happy to. Um, so I'm going to share a screen right now just to kind of share um, some visuals with everyone. Hopefully you can see it. Here we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so to start, um, yeah, when I create any book um, at all, I always start with inspiration and it was no different for this book. Um, I took, you know, the only difference is that because with this book, I was um, a new mom. There was definitely limited time that I could spend wandering around and daydreaming. Um, but the process was still very similar, although condensed in time. I often will gather um, all the visuals into a visual inspiration folder prior to starting any sketching. Mm -hmm. And um, these are, you know, I'm not at this point really understanding or knowing what the, what the book will look like, but I know what it feels like. So the manuscript, you know, in the manuscript um, reading phase, I'm really looking for what is the overall feeling of this book. Um, and then that goes with really understanding what the message is and my personal um, connection with the story. And then the visuals inform the feeling um, of, of um, the, what, the vis what, the, what the book will be. So um, it turns out that for this one in particular, I started to look at a lot of um, kind of different like, you know, different things like Russian animation, German expressionist work, photos of bear cubs, and some collage work from mid-century artists. And, um, and then also, like I said, I, I looked at a lot of photos of bear cubs um, because I knew that in order for me to be able to create a believable, believable character, I really needed to understand the behavior of bears and understand the body language of bears because we are, because I really knew that I was going to be um, showing the emotional journey of this little bear um, through his body language, right? Um, and so I watched a lot of videos of little bear cubs in their natural habitat. And um, this is one of my favorite videos that I watched 
that informed a lot of the book. Um, you can see here, this is a, a pretty rare sighting of um, an Emmy cub. And what they're known to do is they're known to hide a lot of um, like wood chips and rocks and Some nooks and crannies. And they also love to, um, to collect branches and things like that. Um, and you wanna make sure that you don't get too close because they're really wild. So you wanna keep your distance because look at the So you have to make sure. Um, but um, obviously that, that's my son. Um, he's a huge inspiration for this book. And um, and then the other, the other bear cub that was a huge inspiration for the book was a pretty famous cub, as it turns out. Um, his name is Smudge, and he's pretty well known online, but I didn't really know anything about Smudge until I started to research bear cubs. And as it turns out, um, coincidentally, he's also a moon bear, which is mm -hmm. such an um, interesting coincidence. And he has a patch of white on his chest which is, is something that I use to um, create the character for our book, our bear book. Katya, did you find the image before you knew that it was a moon bear? Um, yeah, I found the, the, the image before I knew. Yeah. And then I started, of course, like Googling moon bears to like find out, you know, like more about them. It's pretty yeah. interesting. Um, but it, it, honestly, like as I was doing the research and I compared other types of bears to the moon bear, the moon bear just is so much more, they're just really odd. You know, there's something really kind of interesting and specific about them. So it turned out that it was, it, it just fit in many ways than just a name. Um, and so I start with uh, photos, right? And I start with my visual um visual folder and then I start doing sketches and at this point I'm being very very loose I don't really care about how good they look I don't really care about the medium that I'm using I'm really just trying to capture a feeling um, and then there are times when uh, the the photograph that I'm using is exactly the perfect photograph for uh, a, a you know a scene in the book and so this one turns out that it actually became something that you know, I was I based it on this photograph right here, and it was the perfect image for that for for a page from the book. The uh oh, page. Uh, so after I do the character sketches, then I go back to doing storyboards because now I already know what. By the time I finish character sketching and doing some exploration sketches. I have a pretty good idea of what the world of the bear is going to look like and feel like. And it's just about now it's about figuring out what scene work for um, the page turns. And you can see here that these storyboard pages are looking pretty finished. And you're right about that because this is actually like a third and fourth pass. Um, my initial sketches are really, really rough. Um, they sometimes look like stick figures almost. So at this stage of what I'm showing you here, this is this would be the stage where we're getting close to deciding on on final sketches. Um, and and this this I found that the more specific I get with my images, the better it is to have a dialogue about what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then and then at this point, then I take the sketches, the storyboard pages, and then I start finalizing them. And again, at this point, I'm really just using a variety of different mediums, like I'm using charcoal, I'm scanning things in, I'm collaging things together, I'm moving things around in Photoshop to kind of find the right composition. And then after I do, then I transfer everything onto illustration board and I do traditional media. And for this book in particular, I used mixed media, um, which is just, you know, I used a bunch of different tools like pastels, paints, um, color pencils, and collage and paper collage. Um, and I'll take you through one, one image step by step. So this is a, the image of the moon coming up between between the two mountains um, to soothe our bear. And 
in this image, I for this image, I sketched it in charcoal and then I scanned it into Photoshop. And then I overlaid color on top of it. So I do like a little bit of a color script before I go into final in, in Photoshop. I do the color script in Photoshop and I do the finals traditionally. So this is the, the color script part. And the color scripting is really useful because it allows me to really see the journey of the story through color. And it, you know, it's just yet another layer of communication and narrative storytelling. And then there is, this is the fine, this is the uh, one of um, the pieces that, uh, this is not the final, this is sort of the process, a process piece on illustration board. And you can see that here I used um, paint here and I use some charcoal here and some color pencils. And then for the final, I added collage for the rays of our moon. Oh. And, um, all, um, and of course, the whole time I'm thinking about where the text is gonna be. So I made sure to leave enough room for that. I didn't even notice that that was collage necessarily. How do you create the rays? I I tore pieces of paper. Torn or cut? Torn. Yeah, it was, you can see how they're frayed edges. Can you see that? A little bit, it's, it's somewhat hard to see in the image, but now I'm opening my book. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see because it gets flattened out in the scan. But oh yeah, I can see. But actually the frayed edges really make it more tactile. If I had cut them, it would look a little bit like, it could actually even look a little digital, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, these little accidents and these little things that are kind of irregularities really create that feeling of, of it being more tactile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So after I finish all the interiors, then I go on to everything else. So we're talking about the cover, the end papers, the case, and then the full title and the half title. So there's a lot to be done still, even after you finish, you know, 32 illustrations, there's still a lot more to, to go. Um, and I don't know about any other artists, but for me, it really takes the journey of creating the interiors for the book for me to really arrive at what I ideas for the cover. Mm -hmm. I really need to get to know what this this book will be and 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 really get a sense of of the the something that you know is hard for me to kind of imagine with like just loose sketches so um at this point i start pitching cover ideas and i'm going to share with you all a really early early concept that got scrapped pretty quickly because of production costs and i think it's also just not um something that um, travels well. I think there's like con um, concerns about it not um, not or getting damaged. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about having you know a die cut of um, a die cut on the O, the moon, and then revealing the balloon on the other side. Which I always love little secrets and things like that. Um, but these are some sketches of the cover, and here are some scrap ideas. For the cover, um, this one, and this one ultimately was the one that everyone responded to as as the cover. Um, so this is just a sketch, and you can see that the type is really loose here. I after I sketched this out, then I started to do color comps, and then after color comps, then I hand lettered. Um, a variety of, of type treatments to see which one fit best. And then we arrived at this one, which is the final cover. And at that point, I did the end papers and the case. And you can, I think you will remember from the scrap pieces, yeah. the ideas that the end papers or the case is one of the scrapped ideas for the cover. And, um, and yeah, like I think the journey to create a whole a book is to really maximize um, 
the real seed of the entire book into telling the story. So the story doesn't just start from the first page of the interior of the titles. I think it starts with the end papers all the way to the other end, to the, to the very, very end. So that's how I think about it. So for our, our, um, our book, the end papers start with, you know, a scene of the, the, the balloon traveling through this kind of ethereal, but sort of, you know, more mountainous kind of landscape. And then the very, very last page, which is the end paper of the last page, is um, instead of the balloon, now is the moon because the balloon is gone. And this is just a half title and the full title sketch. And then, and then I'm done. And every time I finish a book, I take a picture of all the finished pieces on the floor. So that's that's all of it together. I remember receiving a text message with that image and being yeah. so excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because I literally live with my paintings when I'm are all around me when I'm paint when I'm creating a book because I need to make sure everything's cohesive that I line everything up as I paint all around me so I'm literally living with it um but that's that's it Katya are are all of your um books that well documented I mean do you have documentation is that part of your process too oh my gosh I've had to be better at that I honestly, I think, to be honest, I feel like the bear in the moon was not well documented, you know, just because of, I mean, all the, the things that you're seeing in the slide are things that I have tangibly, right? Like I didn't actually, right. but I don't have any shots of myself in the studio. Right. It was a exhaustion, you know, like with being a new mom and everything, but what about for you? Did you, do you, do you have a lot of things that you kind of keep from like scraps and things like that to kind of? That's a good question. I mean, most of those pages get recycled. Okay. Um, I have, um, I always have like one of these sort of sturdy books that I write in. So I'm sure I could probably find the initial notes. Um, the origin of the story for me was, it was December, 2016. Uh, and it was one of those stories that really arrived suddenly and almost completely um, in a, in like a, it was really like this, the opening is opening his eyes after a long snooze, the bear saw a red dot in the blue sky and it floats closer and closer. And really the process of writing was um, like receiving. It felt kind of like that, which doesn't happen very often. So when it does happen, it feels very, very, very magical. Um, and I remember writing in the car and I remember it was like one of those moments of just getting it down, getting it down, getting it down. And then um, I had this artist residency. So this is before Katya and I even knew each other. Um, so this is January, 2017. And I had an artist residency because I was on sabbatical from Brooklyn College. And I was on an island in Bahia across from Salvador, this tiny, tiny island, and um, which was amazing. And I had this studio and outside the window every day, the moon rose and set. So it was like, I've never in my life seen so many moon rises and um, just like spent so much time with the moon. So really at that point, once I had it all written out furiously in notes, then I got to shape it there. Um, and sort of start to paginate it and start to imagine how it would, where the page turns would be and, and then constantly trimming and trimming and trimming. Um, and while I was there, I had to give a final presentation at Sakatar Institute, this, this artist residency, which um, they were so generous and such an incredible place to be able to work. And they um, asked me to present, but everyone who was coming to the presentation spoke Portuguese. So through one of the fellow artists on this um, residency, he sent it to a poet friend in Sao Paulo. And it was translated into Portuguese and then read aloud by my friend at the final presentation. And so I was hearing it in Portuguese. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, by a poet from Sao Paulo. So. That was kind of interesting, the Brazilian connection. Um, 
Right. Right. And just a surprise, because when I approached you at the Brooklyn Museum uh, Children's Book Fair, I didn't know that you were Brazilian, that you had a background. And I didn't know that you created this in Bahia, which is such an interesting place. Anyway, I've never been to Bahia, which is insane, but. <laughs> well, hopefully when this is over, you can, you can go someday. Yeah. Or we could have an artist residency there. There you go. Um, so I'm interested in sort of talking about the meaning and I realized that our guests, many of them haven't read the entire story. So, um, while we don't want to get too far ahead of you, um, I guess what I'll bring up right now, which I think is interesting is how, when you make a book with an author and an illustrator, that the story becomes something else, um, that that I, when I wrote it, I had a very, very vivid and specific visual experience of writing it. And I saw it a certain way. And then, um, and I also had my ideas about what it meant. But anyone who writes knows that, you know, you don't, when you're writing something, you're not like actively thinking, this is what it means, or this is what it means to me. Like it's sort of, the writing happens and then you can actually, you almost like approach it like a reader in some ways mm. and feel like what resonates and what might this story be about? So that was a conversation that I started having with, um, with Erica, my agent. And then as we pitched it and, um, and Melissa Manlove, the editor, like that conversation really continued. And what was so fascinating for me is that people really see different things in this story and have a different experience of it. So true. I'm so curious about your experience having, in hindsight, looking at it. Well, to me, um, I think a big part of this book is about the way as children, and I'm tempted to say we, but maybe this isn't everyone's experience. Um, but I think a lot of children carry around guilt or a feeling like they've done something wrong. And so much of childhood is this experience for me, again, is of like having these thoughts, but not necessarily knowing how to express them or not knowing with whom it's safe to express those yeah. thoughts. A lot of them are fears and it's, it's like this anxiety over um, guilt. Now, part of it is that I grew up Catholic and so it's a little bit in the culture, you know, um, just being taught from a young age that, uh, you know, about original sin and sort of the rich, the nightly ritual of kind of reviewing the day and looking for when you did something wrong. I mean, that was definitely a formative part of my childhood experience. But for me, the story really felt like the bear um, carries around this sense that it's its fault for the destruction of the balloon. And it's the moon that speaks to the bear. And it's the moon that consoles and soothes the bear's anxiety. So as I was like encountering the story after it had, I had written it, I was like, oh, this is about the way that the natural world can offer solace and comfort to us human beings carrying these burdens and thinking that um, we've done something wrong. So it's, it's sort of about the consoling ability of the natural world. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I can really see that um, that really comes through so 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 well in the story. And it excites me to the thought that like that kids who have a similar experience of feeling a little haunted or or worried that they um, are you know made a mistake or have done something wrong could have that as an outlet or to have that conversation that could lead to an airing out of whatever that is because kids carry that stuff around for years, you know? And they normalize that, right? So if yeah. it's a place to actually have a conversation about it, you can just feel like it just becomes part of your identity. Right. Like there's this memory of something that you've done. And then sort of a, uh, what you're talking about also is the, is the sort of um, taking, um, taking the sort of, instead of, instead of it being about the bear being bad, it's actually about, right? It's not, it's not the, the bear is bad, but it's actually the, 
the moment was um, hard and that there's something about that that's a distinction that's being made there, right? right? Yeah, and it's about um, being forgiven and or, or actually discovering your innocence. Like the bear, when the moon says, good bear, kind bear, don't worry bear. Um, it's about like the recognition of your innocence. Um, but so, so that's where I want to sort of turn it to you because I think one of it, you made this amazing Venn diagram of like different aspects of what the story is about so that we can talk about that and share that with other people. Right. And, and you, f friendship was a big aspect of the story for you. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, there's a lot of things that, that this story kind of brings up for me. Um, one of which was what you talked about, which is the natural world being a place that of healing and of solace and it being tied to this connection that we have with nature that mm -hmm. so often I think today we can overlook because of busyness and because there isn't the kind of direct, what can feel like quiet can actually just can actually be an arriving right to oneself mm -hmm. yeah but it's 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 kind of a, a place that many of us have forgotten to explore and i think so yeah i relate to what you said absolutely um and i go there with meditation for myself yeah. and i think it's, it's just as connected um because we are part of the natural world so whether we're going on a hike or whether we're just exploring inwards we're really connecting to that same life flow i believe mm -hmm. um and and yet yeah, some of the other themes that came up for me were themes around friendship like you said um because friendship is a complicated thing and i remember you and i talking about um the idea of this being a friendship between a bear and a balloon an inan inanimate object right and how that's an interesting kind of dynamic and whether or not and I, and I mentioned that I, I see that as being a symbol of, of, of true acceptance, right, in friendship, because um, when you are friends with someone and you truly love them, you are accepting them for their whole, everything they can bring to the table and, and their limitations. And the bear does that with the balloon. It doesn't question that it's not another bear. It doesn't question anything about this balloon being this foreign object, it just receives it for what gifts the balloon can give the the, the bear. And it, it, it delights in it. Um, so that kind of innocent sort of engagement um, with another mm -hmm. being, even if it's inan inanimate, it really speaks to friendship for me. I love it. And <clears throat> I, I wouldn't have come to that um, on my own. It's really like through your experience of the book, and I will also say, um, when I I had imagined a sort of grown solitary bear, kind of like not an old bear, but an <laughs> not the baby. I had to envision the baby, and so the fact that you found the moon bear and turned it into that adorable baby bear character um, is so genius. And that's something that, like I said, I didn't envision. So that really allows the child, I think, to, it, I think it invites the identification more yeah. than it was the sort of towering bear version of myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I never saw it any, any other way. So I didn't, you know, it, it's so interesting to think that you were thinking about it completely differently than I was. And that's what's so magical about this collaboration. Um, the way that there's a story that I wrote um, and that I envisioned, and then your your response to it creates this like third story, this third experience. Um, but it's you know so intertwined between um, what we both brought to it. But then it becomes this other thing, and and then it has a life. And I should say, um, a lot of people see this as a story about loss, right. which I think it also is, of course. Yes. And that it could be used with to talk to children about the feelings you have when something is lost or goes away. 
Yeah, certainly, you definitely can. Um, it, it is a, a very sensitive topic, and um, and from the perspective of children, you know, like you said, in, in entangling all the little emotions that go along with loss, because like the feelings of guilt, the feelings of um, not really understanding how to deal with a big emotion of right. something not being right. there anymore, right? Um, even that alone is, is is worth kind of sitting with and talking with a child about and pausing and um, and then also I think it's a, also a moment to talk about love. Just it's also a book about love. I think about that, you know, because for me being um, being that I I did the illustrations while while being a new mom. I mean, the message of goodwill in the book in in that is saying that. Mm -hmm we are all ultimately good and that things can be forgiven. You know, there's something about that that I thought was just so beautiful. Mm. I love that. Um, by the way, those of you that are here, um, it's funny because we're talking to each other, but I am so glad that you're here and I would love to answer any questions um, or field any questions that you might be having. Uh, I know that a lot of you haven't read the book, so, but if, if you're interested in any of something that we've talked about or would like to hear more, if you post a comment, post a question, um, we'd be really happy to respond to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that, <clears throat> I have a question for you, Matthew. Yeah. Um, when do you think a, a manuscript is done in your, in your mind? Um, I think when it goes to print, like that last, 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 like the last moment before it goes to print, I think. Um, because I mean, I love that about it. Like, I love the work. I love the rigor of figuring out what comes to light when the images meet the words and they merge. And then so many things come to light. Um, and then when you have other really interesting, intuitive, smart people, your team or people adjacent to the team who like notice things, uh, then you revisit and you should revisit, I think, up until the very, very, very last moment. Like one of the things that happened with this with this story is that it felt sad. People cried. I mean, the manuscript made, <laughs> made people cry. Yeah. And um one little revision is there's this moment where he's like, bad bear, bad bear, he thought, bad, bad bear. But right until the end, it was um, the sky had sent him uh, a bright red moon and he had ruined it. And then it said, bad bear, bad, bad bear. And it was like, bam. I mean, people who read that page were like, and um, so we had to take out the word ruined because it just was too yeah. strong. And then instead of bad, bad bear, it was bad bear he thought. So that slight adjustment of pointing out that there was an inner voice and it was not just to make it clear that it wasn't the narrator's voice accusing the bear, but that it was a reflection of his inner voice mm -hmm. was a necessary revision that happened um, at the 11th hour. Yeah, and I remember having that conversation with you. And I thought it was so brilliant, that little distinction, right? Of it turning from the judgment of the narrator to an inner voice, right? Because of the, the sort of confusion about where to place this big mo emotion, right? And yeah. it was, yeah, I really love that. And, um, and Melissa, my editor was like, brought my attention to that. And she was, it was so great to have that conversation because she wasn't, she never was like, this must be changed, but it was like opened up another conversation we had. Okay. So I'm going to try this trick. Um, this is Haleen. Hi, Haleen. And, <laughs> and she writes, thank you, Katia Matthew. You're so wonderful. Can you tell us more about the interaction between author and illustrator through the creative process? Were page concepts ever discussed? The interaction, hmm. um, page concepts. Let's start with the first question. Yeah, um, so, right. Um, 
I mean, Matthew and I met before he submitted the manuscript officially. And, um, and we knew that we wanted to work together, but yeah, but in terms of the creative process being a back and forth, there were, there were points where I had questions about some of the things that were, were being revised within the, the team. And I wanted to see how Matthew felt about it. And that's very different than I normally do things. Normally in, a, in a, all my other books, I have had a very, very specific team that I work with and, and I never talked to the author. Um, but with Matthew, we did go back and forth a little bit, right? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, we, we had, um, I think we were invited, you know, often it's, you sort of communicate through the editor and the art director. And so it's often kept separate, not, not in every instance, but, um, but we like had a couple moments of texting each other and we met for breakfast that one time in Fort Greene. Yeah. Um, and got to really like talk about the story. And I think that makes a huge difference. I mean, that breakfast, just being able to connect, I think we invest in a different way when we, you know, feel that connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also there was so much fun. Like, remember I, like, I got, I like sent you a care package from Berlin, which I, I think was stray, but then I sent another one. It was amazing. So Matthew sent me a bunch of gummy bears and other things that were just amazing to inspire my journey and feed me <laughs> through Mary, the Mary Oliver poem. Mary Oliver poem, which okay. I wish I had here because it's so beautiful. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, he, it was amazing to do that. Um, we're patient mm -hmm. ever discussed. Oh, I was just looking, there's another question. Should we? Yes. Okay. Let's try this other one. Sylvia. How do you both personally deal with imposter syndrome, self-doubt and rejections? Well, I've, I've been trying to break into picture books and feeling very discouraged and isolated. Sylvia, yeah. good question. Um, what do you think, Matthew, do you have? I think um, my first reaction is um, it's really, it's really hard. It's hard to break in. So like I sympathize and I feel you. Um, uh, and I think my, I don't know, the thing that keeps coming up, it sounds cliche, is if you really want it, just to never give up. I think that you have to knock on doors and knock on doors sometimes more than once. And of course be gracious. And I think also just like write, right, 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 right. I mean, people have like one story and they're like, I want to break in. And I'm like, now I, I think have five, like have five that you really like, because if you get that situation where someone says, great, let's talk. They're always going to say, what else do you have? Like, Oh, great. So what other, your, what are your other ideas? What are your other ideas? So it's good to have to be, you know, to, to not see it as a short term thing to like sort of take the long look and really respect the apprenticeship of it, like the rigor of kind of building and building over time and not look at it as something that happens quickly. And that if you really have that desire and you have something that you wanna give, a story that you wanna tell in that way, um, I think you hang in there. I don't know, what do you think, Katya? Wow, so well said, Matthew. I really relate to everything you said. And um, in addition, I just want to say that, yeah, rejections are really hard. It's really hard, but um, it's exactly what you said, Matthew. I think it's, it's the, you know, sticking with it. Um, the journey to publication, it's, it's honestly, it's a roller coaster. And even while you're being published, it's a roller coaster. Publishing <laughs> is a roller coaster. Creative life is a roller coaster. Um, I don't think there's ever a, a place where you feel like I've, I'm here now. So I feel like I've, I'm done, right? So there's always something else that you're looking to do. There's always a, a, another sort of creative barrier that you're looking to break through. Um, and hopefully you will have many of those because that that, that is the adventure of being a creative person.
person. Um, but embracing um, the journey is a big part of um, staying with it and know that um, imposter, uh, imposter syndrome is, is absolutely a part of the breakthrough process. Um, every time I work on a picture book, I have no idea what I'm doing. I mean, I start with in diving into the unknown um, and, and, it's, and it's scary because I, I literally think, well, can I actually do this? Um, so I don't think that, um, I don't think any, I mean, at least I, I'll speak for myself, I have not yet <laughs> gotten to a place where I don't have self-doubt. And I, and I, in fact, I think about that as a good thing. I think about doubt as a way of actually processing through something new. Um, the feeling of not having ground under you is just a sign that there's something that is surfacing um, and that those emotions will pass. But you do have to have both like a grit and also an awareness of what the journey will look like because everyone hits a creative wall at some point, you know, everyone does, I can assure you. Um, and so don't feel alone and rejections are really, really tough. Um, but like Matthew said, if you um, feel, you know, stick with it and um, do more than one thing, you know, a lot of times like if something isn't working, I leave it and I try something else and I kind of go back when it feels fresh again. Um, Give yourself a break and um, keep with it. We need good stories and we need everyone to kind of join in. So. Yeah. And, and um, as much as you can, don't get bitter. Stay with what you love about it. Like get closer to what you love about the art form and about stories and um, study the people you love, study the books you love, get close to them. Um, they kind of, I think that they kind of rub off. You know what I mean? It's too easy. Like if you're in a group of people who are feeling discouraged, it's, it can become toxic. So I think it's important to like avoid that and keep returning to the thing about it you love and make from there, create from that place. Right. And then one more thing I would add is um, maybe join like a writing group or a illustration group, you know, to workshop together. It can be really nice to be able to check in with people and, um, and workshop things together as a team. Um, so we're, we're nearing, we have, we have a, about six more minutes. So let's, there's one more question from Jessica. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, let's see. Because of the times that we are in, what was the biggest hurdle in this process? It was fascinating seeing the illustrative process behind this. Yeah. Hi, Jessica. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I think because of these times, yeah. I mean, I would say that for myself, the biggest hurdle has been time. You know, I have a two-year-old. Um, so yeah. it's been just incredibly hard to find any semblance, semblance of um, – you know, a creative process that feels like it, it falls into any kind of flow. It literally now is, is, it's more of a showing up during certain hours and making it work and, and pulling through. Um, but that's been one of the biggest struggles for me in hurdles. But what about you, Matthew? Um, I, this has been a really, <laughs> This project has been um, really joyful and um, pretty hurdle free, I would say. Um, but I have other projects that where there are so many hurdles. So I could speak to hurdles, but for this project, I nothing like leaps to mind. I, I think um, I was just, it was a gift. Like this story felt like a gift. And um, so, and then I found Katya. So, and there's like, I have no complaints, in other words. And Chronicle also, like, the process was, um, it was really satisfying. It was really fulfilling. I want to say to those of you that are still here, um, I haven't done this yet, but I mean, okay, one hurdle is that I'm in Berlin and Katya's in Pennsylvania. Under normal circumstances, we would be five minutes apart from each other on Union Street and Fort Greene. Um, and we would be reading this book in our local bookstores. We'd be out like Greenlight and Books Are Magic and 
community bookstore and we'd be holding the book in front of kids. So one hurdle is how to share this book uh, under these circumstances. Um, part of me is like, these are these the book suits these times. Like I think there's a, a lot of young people and grown-ups are dealing with loss and are dealing with difficult feelings. And so I think the book, I'm excited that the book is emerging now. I mean, that makes me happy. But we don't get that person-to-person -person interaction in promoting it. So this sounds like a segue to like a commercial, but actually I'm sharing this incredible book plate because the solution that we came up with, which other people are also using, is to create a book plate. But Katya created such a beautiful book plate. Um, it's a risograph print. Katya, will you tell them about this? Yeah. So it's a Rizzo, it's a risograph print, which means that it, it's you know, printed with um, fluorescent, it can be printed with fluorescent colors and it really mimics the colors in the book almost exactly. And it's, um, yeah, we're really, really excited to be able to put that in the book and make it that extra special because we can't be there with you all, mm -hmm. find your books and personalize it. So this is our way to kind of put our, a little special touch, yeah. you know, say that, thank you. Um, it's, it is such a weird time to, to, to have a book come out, but we're we're trying our best to to it's in some way connect with you all. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so Katya made these in Pennsylvania and then sent them to Berlin and I signed all 500 and then sent them back to Books of Wonder. And so we'll end tonight's um, event by telling you that Books of Wonder is if you order through them, uh, you get a copy with one of these signed book plates. Um, so you can, uh, Katya, do you want to, well, I mean, I'll just put Books of Wonder in the comment and you can, you can find them so easily. But um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Books of Wonder, it's uh, an institution, one of the great, large, independent um, children's bookstores in Manhattan. Um, so you can order directly through them and, and your copy will come with that signed booklet. Mm -hmm. Yep. This has been such a pleasure, Katya. Thank you so much, um, and thank you to Erica um, and Stumble Alive for hosting us. Thank you, especially to you guys who are hanging in there still, um, an hour in, and taking the time out of your day to to talk to us and talk with us. And um, I hope that you find a copy of The Bear in the Moon and that you can finish it. Uh, and enjoy it and share it with someone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.